John, looking at the brain, you would hardly think that that three pounds of wet meat can cause the, all of the rapturous things that mm. we can think about. And uh, therefore, it's caused all sorts of philosophical debates over millennia. Well, we have dualists who mm. believe there's different kinds of stuff, materialists who say no. You've refuted it all and have come up with something called biological naturalism. Yes. Well, let me, uh, first of all, share your sense of awe and wonder. That's where philosophy starts. Uh, philosophy begins with the sense of amazement that things are the way they are. And it is astounding that this, as you say, a kilogram and a half, about three pounds of this icky stuff, it's about the texture of English oatmeal, that <laughs> that's where all of our conscious life goes on and process there cause everything in our conscious life. However, you ask about my own view, and let me uh, state it briefly. Um, uh, philosophers feel more comfortable with labels, and I call my view a biological naturalism. I'm not passionately wed to the label because it says the mind is a biological phenomenon. That's the right level to explain it, and it's part of nature. It's a part of the natural world that goes on at the level of biology. So you reject the dualist view <laughs> of two different kinds of stuff, a mental stuff or a spiritual stuff, and you reject the materialist view who generally say consciousness is either an illusion or something mm -hmm. that's mm, not really involved with the world or some other way to get rid of it. Both dualism and materialism, I think, are trying to say something true, but they end up saying something false, and I'm trying to tear the true part mm -hmm. apart from the false part. The materialist says physical reality is all the reality there is. It's all uh, 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 physical particles and fields of force. D the dualist says there is a part of reality that's irreducibly mental, and I want to preserve both of those. Now, how do you do that? Right. Well, step number one is you take the brain seriously after you've first established what I, I want to do, that consciousness really exists. I mean, I, maybe I should I, I emphasize that, that there are some people who try to deny the existence of consciousness, but that won't work because the way that we typically get rid of things in science is by showing that there's an illusion of color, an illusion of solidity, an illusion of liquidity, but it reduced to something else. But that won't work for consciousness because where consciousness is concerned, the illusion is the reality. If it consciously seems to me that I'm conscious, then I am conscious. So that's, that's the That's different thing. than the materialist. That's different from the materialist. The materialist, the, uh, the eliminated materialist, thinks you can eliminate consciousness by showing that it's an illusion. And I say you can't do All right. that. Number okay. one, we accept consciousness as, as real. As real and irreducible. Okay. Now step two is you start to ask, well, uh, like anything else in biology, what causes it? What's causally responsible? And when I first got interested in this, I went out and bought a whole bunch of textbooks on the brain and just sat down and read them. By the way, that's the way to learn a field. If you, <laughs> if you want to uh, know something about the field, go buy the undergraduate textbooks. Yeah. And, and in the end, you can get a feel for the subject. Now, unfortunately, we don't know an awful lot about the brain. Uh, we don't know uh, exactly uh, why uh, 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 the, processes that result, the, the processes that result in a stimulation of my nerve endings cause a pain to occur in the brain. And we don't know all the details, even about vision. But let's take a case where we do know something about it. If you track the visual stimulus through the optical system, over the optic chiasma, and back through the lateral geniculate nucleus, and, and then uh, through the visual cortex, and then uh, forward into the uh, cortex, uh, then it's, it's pretty obvious this process is causing visual experiences. We don't know all the details, but this is why red looks red, because there are a series of neuronal processes in the brain that cause the visual experience. Okay, so that's step two. That's step two. Step two, all conscious states are caused by neuronal processes, okay. step two. All right, but now then you ask, have to ask is, yes, and what's their mode of existence? How, how do they exist? And there the answer, I think, follows more or less immediately, namely, all of these conscious states, everything is realized in the brain. It's all going on in the brain in a certain piece of neuronal architecture. And, and this runs counter to a whole tradition we have of discussing these things that say 
Consciousness can't have a spatial location, mm -hmm. but we know in fact that it does. And with current imaging techniques, we're actually able to discover where certain conscious processes go so on. So does that mean like step three then says that consciousness is a function of, of the higher brain systems, that these brain systems that you can see light up in these images? Exactly, okay. exactly. That is, you see, if you go through these steps, it's real, it's caused by brain processes, then what you're going to find is that the brain processes that cause specific conscious states are likely to be architecturally specific to certain parts of the brain. Uh, if you could uh, send the stimulus from your ear or uh, in into the optic centers, then you would have a visual experience uh, uh, corresponding to the uh, the auditory stimulus. In fact, we do get something like that when you have what's called phosphines, seeing stars. Oh, yeah. If somebody Push punches you in the eye, yeah. somebody punches you in the eye, you see stars, you see a flash. That's because the, the stimulus is going to the visual cortex and through the visual system. So the neuronal architecture is, is not just random or accidental. It's quite specific to specific conscious okay, modalities. Now, uh, then, then, then to go from there, though, you still come back and say that consciousness does have causal impact. Yes, that it's not exactly. something that's, that's irrelevant or so-called epiphenomena which is kind of yeah. riding on the surface with no, 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 no real impact. You say that in your system, in your system, yeah. biological natural, that consciousness really does have causation. Right. Okay. So now we got, we got up to the, this far. Consciousness is real and irreducible, caused by brain process. It exists in the brain. Yeah. What's it do? Yeah. Well, it's obvious uh, that it, it plays an enormous role in our lives. It functions causally. I, I like to give the example of deciding to raise my arm and then the ar my arm going up, but that's just one example among many. I have a thought in my brain, and it, guess what? It produces uh, words coming out of my mouth. I have these intentions to answer Robert's questions, and this actually causes behavior. So there, there isn't any question. If we just look at the facts now and forget about the philosophical tradition, that consciousness functions causally in producing behavior. Taking it all together, you then would draw an analogy between the brain doing consciousness and the gut doing digestion. Exactly. That's, a con that's an example I like to use because what I want to do is demythologize consciousness. Think of it as an ordinary biological process that happens to go on in the brain in the way that digestion happens to go on in the, in, the, in the stomach and the rest of the digestive tract. Let's try to get rid of this deep mystery. Now you might say, but it just isn't like that. Well, I have another analogy I like to use, and that is the history of the debates about life. Uh, there was a time, not all that long ago, a century ago, when probably near this very spot, people debated passionately about the question, can you ever give a scientific account of life? Can you ever give an account of how matter could come become alive. Mm -hmm. Now we can't feel those passions anymore. That problem has been, for the in large part, solved. We with the, with the understanding of the replication of the DNA and RA, RNA, we have a pretty good understanding of the biochemical basis of life. We no longer feel that as an issue. And what I'm suggesting is that as our understanding of the brain improves, and we are making progress. I mean, I don't want to give you the idea that we don't know anything. We know quite a lot. As, as our understanding of the brain improves, I believe that the problem of consciousness as somehow a deep metaphysical problem will be treated as a scientific problem like any other and will be solved in the same way that the problem of life was solved. Here's the problem I have with the consciousness digestion analogy. Consciousness is not like digestion. Uh, maybe, maybe the perception of vision is like is a digestion. Maybe the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the hormonal systems are like digestion. A lot of things are like digestion, not consciousness. Yeah, well, all analogies break down somewhere. And there is a disanalogy between consciousness and digestion, and that is, in an ordinary sense, once we get a complete knowledge of the causal structure of digestion, we do an ontological reduction. We say a, a digestion is nothing but 
all, all of these processes, but we ontology can't do that. Ontology meaning the, what's the real existence yeah, of Yeah, ontology just means that which exists and the nature of its existence. So we do an ontological reduction based on the causal reduction. The causal analysis enables us to say that's really all there is to digestion. But you can't do that with consciousness because consciousness has this subjective or first-person ontology. Its mode of existence is to exist only when it's consciously experienced by a human or animal subject, and you can't get rid of that. So, I think so typically, a, a causal reduction leads to an ontological reduction. In the case of consciousness, you get a causal reduction, but no ontological reduction. I think this is enormously significant. You say typically, but can you name anything else besides no. consciousness in which you have causal reduction without ontological yeah. reduction? I, I think that, that consciousness is special because it's the only thing we know in the universe that has this subjective or first-person ontology. But that's just how nature turned out. <laughs> there may be all kinds of things that are weird. Quantum mechanics seems pretty weird to me. But the way that nature turned out on the little corner of the universe that we inhabit there is a, a, a piece of the universe that's very important to us, but maybe not a very big deal in, in, the, in the larger scheme of things, and that is our conscious states. They are onto, they're causally reducible. They, there isn't anything going on causally except consciousness, but the, the consciousness, uh, there isn't anything going on causally except the neuronal basis of consciousness, which causes consciousness, but the consciousness itself is not ontologically reducible. This articulation that you do is to me so important because it is a materialist view but it is different than every other materialist view because you recognize the uniqueness of consciousness. Yes, uh, and I think that's essential. Remember, my slogan is always don't say anything that's obviously false. <laughs> it's obviously false to say that consciousness doesn't exist. It's obviously false to say there's nothing there but third-person objective properties. It is essentially qualitative and subjective, but it's false to say, therefore, it's not part of the physical world. Of course it's part of the physical biological universe, but it is special. It has this unique feature of ontological subjectivity, and that's how nature turned out. We can't pretend that didn't happen. That's just the way the world works.